Hello and welcome to the UCL IRDR Taster Lecture on Microinsurance. I'm Dr. Joanna Ford Walker, I'm Associate Professor in UCL IRDR and I'm Chair of the Department Teaching Committee. And I'm Rebecca Yor, I'm a final year PhD student also in the UCL IRDR and I work closely with Joanna. So today we're going to be discussing microinsurance. We will start with discussing what it actually is and we will then provide some examples of microinsurance initiatives, why some might have worked, why some might have been less successful, and what themes we see throughout. Um, we will then take a look at what microinsurance is for and fundamentally how does it sit in the intersection between a humanitarian initiative or a business venture and really think about what is it that we're trying to achieve. So to introduce microinsurance, I'm just going to briefly discuss what is insurance. Um, hopefully it's something that's relatively familiar with you, um, for most of you. So insurance is a mechanism to make sure that in the event of, in the case of disaster insurance, in the event of a disaster, that we have a means to regain some of the financial losses or other losses we may have incurred. So, for example, if a catastrophe occurs, you've, you've in advance, you've paid what we call a premium. So that's an amount of money that you're paying usually to an insurance company. It might be an annual premium, so once a year, or it might be monthly. It's a set amount of money. And then there's agreement that if an event occurs, you, you receive the payout to cover your losses. And there's lots of different trigger types and lots of different ways that this amount of money can be calculated. When it comes to microinsurance, what is it we actually mean by microinsurance? Is it just microinsurance or is there a bit more to it? Rebecca, can you explain a bit more about what microinsurance looks like? Yes, yeah, so um, microinsurance is, there are many definitions you'll find in, in the literature or an online search. There are lots of people that have tried to define it in various ways. And quite often it's related to the income of the population that you're looking to design a microinsurance product for. But essentially, um, it, the principles of insurance remain but the micro element really refers to the bespoke conditions or the particular needs of um, the people that you're serving. So quite often it's geared towards lower income people. And so with those, a lot of lower income populations, you have different considerations and that's contextual depending on where you live and also depending on how you earn your money and what your, your social situation may be. So as an example of that, um, thinking about the premiums that you pay for your insurance policy, it may not be appropriate to pay um, one annual premium, uh, one lump sum at the end of every year for your policy. It may be better suited for you to be able to break that down and pay smaller amounts more regularly. It may be more appropriate to pay um, in certain seasons, for example, if you're a farmer and you have harvest seasons when you traditionally have a little bit more expendable income than maybe seasons when you're growing. Um, but it also refers to distribution channels as well. So quite often informal finance isn't always uh, formal finance isn't always an option. Sorry. So it's not necessarily a case of going to an insurance provider or a bank, but it may be that you can buy your policy through a post office or a, um, a telecommunications company or a supermarket. So if you already use mobile money, you can pay premiums through your mobile phone. You can also receive in some circumstances payments, payouts through your mobile phone as well. It may be that it's not an individual policy, but suited to a group of people. So you have a support network for payments um, and you just have a bit of guarantee from other people in your group that can help out if perhaps you fall on financial hardship and, and can't quite make a payment. Um, it also refers to an ability to subsidise premiums. So one of the big issues that we always encounter with microinsurance and serving lower income populations is how is it feasible to be able to pay for premiums? But 
in some situations we find that either an agency like the UN or we have the World Bank or there may be a donor involved in the microinsurance stakeholder network that can actually put some money towards those premium payments and at least initially be able to widen the access and enable people to contribute a smaller amount but still benefit from the protection. Okay, so what we've established is that microinsurance is for those on low income or perhaps even at subsidence level of living. Um, usually the amounts involved are small, you know, in, so the actual premiums are small and the amounts covered are small. It may be then that individuals are grouped together, um, whether that's by sort of physical location, a particular village, for example, or whether it's part of a cooperative or maybe a group of farmers, a group involved in a particular lifestyle. Um, and also you mentioned the idea of it being you know, perhaps subsidized. You wouldn't see that in standard insurance. So that shows that it's a little bit of a, an aid element and a, and a development element in there. And also picking up there on the point of it being not just paid through through standard channels so maybe outside the standard financial systems maybe in more informal channels as a form of payment so it's interesting though because no point did we there put on a specific monetary amount we didn't say it's a policy below a value of x or it's not for people below this level of income so there is a bit of flexibility in that definition so it's sort of way more about the purpose and the thought behind it perhaps as opposed to the actual metrics um, so micro insurance isn't just micro insurance it, it's actually something a bit different there's actually something more going on than just another insurance policy but made for smaller amounts yes. to help people understand what this might look like and how this may run um, we actually looked at 40 case studies from around the world um, Rebecca could you give sort of a couple of these case studies in, in a bit of detail so people understand what their main aims were, how they were structured and who were involved. Yeah, so um, actually tying into your comment, Joanna, about uh, income levels, one of the case studies that we looked at was from Kenya and it was based around healthcare and it was an insurance policy for better access to healthcare. And now this was micro insurance, but it was also aimed at the entire population because at the time of this policy initiative, um, healthcare in Kenya for everyone was actually relatively expensive. And a lot of healthcare needs were being met by just simply payment on receipt of care, so out of pocket. Um, and so this was widely applicable and um, it had several sort of advantageous elements to it. So the stakeholder network was quite concentrated. Um, there weren't so many players within it that it became difficult to manage. So you would have traditionally your insurance provider and your underwriter, you'd have um, you know, local organisations that had built trust with people um, who you were looking to sort of to be your market, your product market, for, for example. But the good thing about it was that it was also tied to a savings account. So people who weren't already banked could benefit from then having a savings account open for them. And it was attached to sort of no claims bonuses and such at the end of every year, a little bit would go into your savings account and that would then also pay off with your, your premium payments. So there was an advantageous cycle of then encouraging savings. There was access then you would have to credit and loans as well because you were registered with this particular institution um, and you would have a bank account in addition to your insurance. Um, another one that we looked at was a very different model uh, based in Haiti, and that was actually targeted towards uh, female entrepreneurs or women who were starting their own businesses, for example, as an extra form of household income. And that was a two pronged model. So they had um, parametric, a parametric element, which parametric is, yeah. a, is a type of insurance um, trigger. So in insurance we have lots of different types that, of ways that people can receive payment and different ways that the amount can be decided now the probably the most common and the ones that generally people are most familiar with is indemnity and this is where essentially the amount you receive is very closely to the amount that you lost so you calculate how much did you lose and then that's what you will receive in the event of, of 
you know, whatever happened to cause you to get that loss, um, subject to any sort of initial, what we call deductible, so or excess you might have heard of in, in advance. If you're going for your own insurance policy, they might say, what's your excess? And that's the amount that you keep yourself. Um, and then anything above that amount, the insurer will, will pay you. So indemnity is quite easy to understand because it's the concept of, well, I, I lose this amount of money and, and in the event of a disaster or something going on, that's how much I receive. But there are some problems with indemnity and that's um, one of them is that you need to actually calculate how much it is that you've lost and, and that can take time. You know, that requires resources and hence that you know, costs money to the insurer as well. So for the case of microinsurance, um, you know, the idea of sending somebody out to assess how much money you've lost in itself might actually cost more than the amount of money you're paying out. And it can take time. And actually that, that speed is really important. So other types of trigger can be more appropriate. And one of these is, is as Rebecca mentioned, was, is a parametric uh, trigger. A parametric trigger is actually based on physical parameters. So for example, in the event of a windstorm, the parametric trigger um, the amount that you will get paid is actually based on the strength of the wind. So whether it's a simple payout mechanism um, where you say if the wind is above this speed, you receive this amount, or whether it's a, a scaled amount where the, the faster the wind blows, the more you may receive. It, it's based on a physical parameter. Likewise, if there was an earthquake, it would be based on how much the ground shakes. And the advantage of these triggers is one, it's very quick because it's, you know, it's taken from some kind of scientific measurement um, and it can be processed you know, almost immediately. And because there's a pre-existing formula to decide your payout, that money can be transferred very, very quickly without the need of all the checks and, and everything else. Um, so this is one of the preferred um, trigger types for, for microinsurance because it's very quick. There are other uh, trigger types as well, but for today, we'll, we'll just stick to indemnity and parametric uh, for the moment. So, sorry, uh, Rebecca, to carry on. As, as I mentioned, parametric triggers are, are useful uh, for, for being quick um, and they also cost less, don't they, in the event of a disaster? Exactly. And I think that's why sometimes um, the parametric model is common, increasingly common, but also this hybrid model that we saw in Haiti, where you did have an indemnity element to it. So um, recognising that in the event of an earthquake or a hurricane, the key element um, or the key need really for, for this, this market was to be able to have some money very quickly and to be able to um, recover stock and be able to resume your livelihood activities. And so the parametric element of that was ideal because you could quickly, the women quickly received payouts. And this actually happened in the wake of the 2010 earthquake. Um, a quick sum of money was paid out and then later, as after the, you know, the, the entrepreneurs were able to make their, their initial adjustments and recover themselves slightly, um, then came the indemnity element and there was a more accurate adjustment of how much loss had, had actually occurred. And so then if some people were missing, um, if they had lost more than they'd been, than they'd received, then that could, that could be um, accounted for and rectified. So that worked quite well in that particular instance, and it does address those issues that we find in the post-disaster environment of the things that we need the most and the most quickly, um, you know, often is money. And the fact that this had that parametric element to it made it more accessible in the first place as a resilience tool for these female entrepreneurs. So that hybrid model, as you say, really it sort of takes away something we call is basis risk. Um, so basis risk is the risk that the money you get paid by the insurer isn't the same as what you lost. So for indemnity, basis risk is, is very low. For parametric triggers, it's actually quite high because it's decided by the formula, which you may have uncertainties associated with it. You, know, you may actually get more damage or even less damage um, than what the formula would suggest. But having this hybrid model between the two seems like the best of both worlds in the case of microinsurance. For, well, certainly for the person who's the insured, um, because it means they get the quick payment, but they also then manage to get that extra indemnity clause to make sure they don't receive less than what they might. Because if they did, that, that could cause a lot of mistrust yeah. um, and it could you know, confuse people after an event. And, and it's something that we have to be quite careful with insurance in general. I think especially in the case of microinsurance, where we are looking at helping people with 
low incomes you know, or substance level to make sure that they do understand what it is they're going to receive, how they're going to receive it and not causing disappointment or you know, the expectations are aligned with reality because that could otherwise cause a lot of damage and, and make people not want to do these things again. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't have an awful lot of experience with insurance, it's a, it's a huge deterrent um, and it does create a lot of mistrust. And, and you're saying interesting if, if people don't have a lot of experience with insurance, is that quite common in microinsurance settings then, that, that actually we're sort of outside um, the main financial systems, including insurance? So these aren't people who are used to having insurance in other the walks of life or in other forms this this is it this is their experience of insurance it can be yeah for, for people um for a lot of populations i mean obviously you know um a lot of people are banked and they have access to formal finance but there are an awful lot of people who aren't and if we're talking about micro insurance as a, a tool of inclusivity then we have to and, and a tool that can reach more vulnerable people then we have to be able to look at mechanisms of engaging people who are perhaps in informal settlements or not connected to formal finance. Um, and this is uh, the microinsurance element of it can be an offput because it's you know another form of insurance and there's typically mistrust because unlike a loan, you don't get your money and then you know it's it's there and then you spend it with insurance as, as an element of trust. So you're paying into something that you're not necessarily going to ever see the benefits from if you don't have to claim. But even if you do, it might be months or years down the line when you actually need that. And so there's a real leap of faith to be able to put what little money you may have on a day to day basis into something that you're not sure is going to really pay off. Um, and if you don't really have any contact with it, there's not a great might, there's not a great insurance culture already established and perhaps not uh, too much understanding about how it works and how it will benefit you in the longer term, um, then it's easy to sort of to miss that importance and, and to not really be able to appreciate how it, it is a good risk transfer mechanism. And that's something we actually saw in quite a few of the case studies that in the process of creating the initiative, they were consulting with people to find out what they actually wanted. Um, but also there was an education element about insurance itself um, and actually understanding what is insurance, what is the policy. And you wouldn't normally see that in a standard insurance policy. It's very much you go along and this is the offering. And, and yes, there might be technical documents where it's all explained, but actually that's not that's not part of the initiative. Whereas in these micro insurance initiatives, we saw a lot of the time part of the policy was actually explaining how it worked and making sure people understood what they were getting. And I, I just wanted to pick up what you mentioned there about, um, you know, it can, the trust elements and how long people pay into these systems for, because as you said, we're dealing with um, perhaps, you know, with disasters that don't happen every year. Um, they may be, you know, many years between events. And if somebody's paying into a microinsurance policy, that's money that they're not getting elsewhere. You know, that's money that's, that's leaving. And if there isn't an event, there is a danger then that people think, well, why am I doing this? And I think the worst thing that could probably happen is that somebody decides, why am I doing this? I'll stop doing it. And then a year down the line, there is a disaster. So what were some of the common themes that we identified or what things went well and what things went badly? You know, when, when were... So case to be successful and did they keep going and, and when were they less successful? So we did, we saw a real variety of this uh, and there are a number of factors that we looked at to try to determine what could be um, a strength and potentially a point of weakness for the, um, the microinsurance products that we looked at. And actually a case study in Uganda encapsulates a couple of points of failure that are really quite important. Um, first of all, it was simply a traditional insurance style uh, product, but it was just shrunken and applied to a population without any particular considerations for context. So it was a broad sort of understanding of what insurance should do. And it wasn't, there were, there were no adaptations within that that then made that appropriate for the specific needs of the population they were then trying to provide micro insurance for. So that was one significant point of failure. 
Um, the other one that that one included as well, actually, is that there wasn't a, there wasn't an adequate enough education element to it. So this was a new product, a new offering to these people, uh, to this population, and there wasn't any attempt to engage these people with what this was now providing, you know, that was supposed to be better than what they currently had, how this was going to be an improvement on the status quo and how it was going to protect them. Um, and that was another point of failure. And that particular scheme wasn't very successful in the long term. Conversely, however, um, the one of the beauties of microinsurance is that it's adaptable. And this is what we saw with the case study in Haiti that we were previously talking about. Um, this was originally designed for um, the individual, so it was it was designed for the individual entrepreneur. And while that was successful in principle, in terms of the blending the parametric with the indemnity, that tended to work quite well, but it was still quite expensive. And it was a little bit difficult to imagine, you know, keeping that, sustaining that over the longer term um, with a product that was viable for, for entrepreneurs whose business is not necessarily that reliable either. Uh, so an adaptation that, that this stakeholder network made, the people that designed the product and implemented the product was rather than targeting individuals, they targeted um, the institutions. So they took it up one level and said, okay, let's have a look at actually protecting the liquidity, the portfolio of the institution providing finance. Um, and that actually enabled them to work much more cost effectively um, by taking it up to that level and covering a portfolio rather than an individual. So that's one example of adaptation that then made that more secure into the long term. And did that one keep going that policy? Was that successful long term? Yes. Wow. Yeah, well, certainly to over the period that they intended it to run. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. OK, so I think what we've learned, I mean, that's just really just a couple of the case studies you know, that we looked at, but... Some really key important messages there is microinsurance is not just microinsurance. Um, it, it can't be seen as the same thing. It can't just be taking insurance and making it smaller because it's actually serving a different purpose and you're, you're dealing in quite a different environment and you need to be adaptable. And we need to learn from case studies where it has worked and where it hasn't and, and make sure they come together. And, and, that, and that chance of being adaptable, actually changing things, is, is perhaps one of the keys to a successful microinsurance initiative. Um, we've learned that microinsurance is dealing with those on, on low incomes. It is dealing with small amounts of money. We may need to group policies. You know, in some of the examples we looked at, we're looking at whether it's a group of people or even an institution. You know, that's a way of keeping transactional costs and administrative costs lower. Um, and that actually benefits those who are being insured. And also having education as part of that campaign um, and making sure that we really are thinking of those involved and making sure it's appropriate for them. So this sort of brings us on to really thinking about what is microinsurance? Who is it for? And is it a business venture or is it a humanitarian initiative? Before we go on to those topics, I want to take a pause and make sure that everyone has sort of understood the concept raised so far. Um, if anyone has any questions, either on sort of particular aspects that we've mentioned or related to, then please you know, do, do ask and then join us again after the break where we will talk more a bit so sort of fundamentally about what, what is microinsurance for and, and about. So if anyone does have any questions at this point, um, Rebecca and I are available. Any points of clarification, do ask aloud or if you want to put them in the chat, if you're not able to share your screen, sorry, if you're not able to sort of go on camera, um, please do ask some questions. After the break, we'll have a second video where we delve more into that uh, question about what is microinsurance for, particularly thinking of it in terms of the humanitarian part and the business venture part. Um, but at this point, if anyone has any questions, do put them in the chat or do ask aloud. Don't be shy. We, we, we like to get really interactive. We like to be challenged. Uh, we do like to get lots of questions, um, either now or, and I say there'll be another chance at the end as well. I've just received one in the chat um, and they've said um, that we mentioned about the timing of insurance um, and how parametric insurance is quick um, and asked us just to talk a little bit about that. 
So um, when it comes to sort of normal insurance claims, what well, I mentioned indemnity claims, where essentially you get paid out how much you've lost, after a very large disaster, you can actually be waiting years. You could be waiting a couple of years um, to get your money back because they have to send out claims adjusters. They need to work out what's going on, find all the policies. It, it may be quicker than that, but it could take a very long time. In the case of parametric triggers, you can see payments as quick as two weeks after an event. So that's the sort of the more extreme events. Parametric payments can be quicker and indemnity um, can be quicker. Um, one example of a particularly quick payment came after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011, for example, when we actually saw that sort of all the insurers got together and they came up with a very simple payout structure initially, where they essentially just divided all claims into three groups, which were um, full damage, where you got at least 50% of the structural damage of your property, half damage, or partial damage. And they immediately paid out quite quickly before, um, within those sort of remits. Um, so actually 80% of claims were paid out within 10 weeks, but that was incredibly quick uh, for such a large event. So that's sort of the exception where they were incredibly efficient. And then afterwards sort of sorted out the more details in the claims, but try to do something quickly. But generally indemnity can be a lot slower. So I hope that gives a little bit um, of insight into the timings of insurance. Are there any other um, points of clarification at this point or any questions on what we've discussed? If not, we will continue and then see you again after the second part of the lecture. Does anyone have anything they want to ask at this point? I see I one. Had, I had a question, if that's right. Please go uh, ahead. So what, when someone's been paying a premium um, but has not had to use the insurance and decides to stop paying it, um, what then happens to the money that they've paid in? Is this, does that just remain with the insurance company or does that, uh, is there any additional cover or is it that just it? They've, they've lost that money and there's no cover from that point. So in terms of when the cover ends, there'll be some form of contract. So depending how they're paying, whether it's annual, monthly, or whether it's informally um, on some of these schemes, within the sort of contract or agreement, it will tell you your period of cover and at some date it ends usually it might end at you know, midnight on a certain date so if there hasn't been an event that would trigger a payout up to that point then yes the insurance company or whoever's sponsoring it um, in the case of micro insurance usually an insurance company but it might be um, someone else will essentially have that money and that goes into the reserves ready to help pay out when there is an event for other people. So you can think of it in a way a bit like pension pots, where maybe you're sort of paying into a scheme and you're not necessarily getting your own money back. You're paying into a scheme and some people are, are getting the money back. Um, so thank you for that question. There's another question um, in the chat. So I'll answer this one and then we'll continue um, with the videos. So it says, what happens if you are overpaid in a parametric payment? Um, if you find you were overpaid at a later date, are you then put in debt? No is the answer to that. So with a parametric trigger, um, or, you know, the work is done initially when trying to determine these payouts. So a lot of work is done um, by the catastrophe modeling firm or expert advisor trying to go from a wind speed, a flood depth or whatever that metric is to a loss and they try and work out with that formula how much should they pay out and obviously they don't want to be overpaying um, because then they'll lose money but they also want to make it as sufficient but there is this thing that I mentioned called basis risk which means it, it doesn't match and that's both for the person insured and for the company paying out so if they overpay well if you like the uh, the insured has won, although I don't really think you can say they've won if they've had a disaster, but you know they, they've received an overpayment and that would stay. So Rebecca mentioned um, an example where we had that mixed payment structure, but they wouldn't pay out more and then take it back on the indemnity. The indemnity would be used as a check to make sure that the insured aren't losing. Um, and as I say, that's rarely used in mainstream insurance um, with that mix of approach in that way. But for micro insurance, it's really to make sure that um, people don't lose because there's this humanitarian side to it as well. OK, I'm now going to continue with the second part of the lecture. So I hope um, that uh, is interesting to you. 
And then if you have sort of more questions at the end, um, please do then ask again. Hello everyone and welcome back to our microinsurance taster session. So before the break, we were talking a little bit about um, defining microinsurance and initially and how elements of the micro differentiate from the regular insurance as we may understand it. And we were looking predominantly at how that means being more considerate of your audience, so who you're aiming your product at, and not necessarily from a financial standpoint, looking at income, but looking a little bit more closely at the specifics of the way that people live their lives and the individual needs in those particular contexts. Going on from that, we looked at a few case studies to then put that into context, uh, and then looked at some of the common themes that ran throughout those case studies that would perhaps um, be deemed important for the success and the take up of a microinsurance product in the location and also some of the potential weak points um, where certain elements weren't considered properly uh, and so they weren't perhaps so successful but one of the key elements was adaptation and I think we across all of the case studies that we looked at in total a degree of flexibility to be able to bespoke your product was one of the overriding themes but in spite of this, what, what is this all for, Joanna? So in terms of a post-disaster environment, why insurance and why micro-insurance and what does it bring that we don't already have? I think one of the most key points is if you have insurance or, or micro-insurance, let's, let's just discuss micro-insurance for now, it, it means you can have a planned reconstruction. So what I mean is that you know that in the, if there is an event, you know how much money you can expect, or if it's based on a formula, you, know, you can look at a range of what you're expecting to receive, and you should know a time frame over which you expect to receive it. And that's a lot more certain than when you're just, let's say, sitting around waiting for aid, either from an NGO or from... Um, government or from other sources and that knowing that you're going to get those funds is important in two dimensions one is on practicalities and the other is also on your own well-being and sense of security and sense of knowing what's going to happen and, and a lot of what our research has shown when speaking to people after disasters is it's that uncertainty of not knowing when something's going to happen, not knowing when you might receive a government subsidy or when you might receive some money from an NGO really does cause distress because you are just essentially sitting waiting. Whereas once you know what's happening, it, it, it just changes how people feel, it changes their, their whole demeanour and it changes their outlook. On the practical side, we don't know exactly when a disaster is going to hit. We don't know exactly when an earthquake will occur, when a windstorm will happen and, and how bad it will be. But with microinsurance, what we can know is that if that event occurs, we know we're going to get our payout and we know we're going to get it within a certain time frame. And so we can plan our reconstruction around that, whether that's our own home. So we know when our own home can be rebuilt because when we will get our funds for it, or in the case of, for example, the entrepreneurs, or we had case studies of sh small shop owners, for example, we can actually know, okay, I'm gonna receive this money, it will cover this product, or it means I can replace my equipment for my small shop, maybe it's uh, a farmer, it can replace some equipment, or I can buy new seeds, whatever it is, there's that certainty, which just means you can plan much more efficiently and actually have a plan in place. So how is that better than just pre-planning aid, could we not just make sure that we get money and materials to people faster? That would be great if we could do that. Um, unfortunately, the way aid often works is after an event, an appeal is made and then people donate. Um, there may be restrictions 
on the money that's given. For example, it may be for a very specific purpose. And sometimes you get a situation where you have two different organizations raising money for the same thing and you actually end up with too much money for one thing and then no money for another. So there are issues in the system. But let's say we could manage all that and actually we could get money in advance and there are mechanisms for doing that. Um, that, that, that could work, you know, we could speed that up and we could, as you say, have it in a situation where it's planned and so people do know how much money they're getting. So that solves that issue. However, it doesn't address the issue of people managing their risk. So it's sort of a self-agency issue. In, in joining a microinsurance scheme and contributing premiums yourself, you're actually allowing people to take ownership of their risk. You're also inviting people to find out more about their risk because a lot of microinsurance schemes, as we discussed earlier, involve that element of education. And actually, we saw an example of one that failed where it didn't have that. It's not just education about insurance and the scheme and how that's working. It's actually education about the risk. And this can be indirect or direct. So in an indirect way, actually, every time you look into purchasing insurance or every time a microinsurance initiative takes place, you are actually indirectly informing people about risk because they become aware, oh, there's a risk. And if one you know, insurance is more expensive than another or if certain features make it more or less expensive, then that actually subtly tells you, ah, oh, maybe I should do this other thing to make it the insurance um, cheaper. But in microinsurance initiatives, there's also planned education and direct education about the risk. So part of the scheme often actually includes some kind of scheme to actually discuss the risks, understand the local context of the risk, and so people become more aware. And if you are yourself part of this scheme and you are paying money, that does likely make it um, more likely that you yourself invest in disaster risk reduction. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean financially investing because you may not be able to do that. But if you understand that different practices are more or less risky, or if there are things you can do, um, you know, just at a personal level or at a family level, then that can actually help lower your risk and not just your assets risk, but actually your own personal risk as well. So knowing that these events could occur might make it more likely for example, that you formulate a family evacuation plan, or it might make you more likely that you have some form of torch um, or something available if an event happens at night, or you have a plan of where you might go and meet if you all you know, get separated in an event, all these sort of things, which may not mean your house doesn't get destroyed, but might help with preservation of life. So the education part of the microinsurance initiative is, is very important. Now you could say, well, we could do planned aid plus education. Yes, we could do planned aid and, and education, but then you don't have that self-agency part. Mm. Another part of this is, as well as it being um, organisations, for example, NGOs who might help with, with subsidies in these um, initiatives, you also get governments sometimes supporting these initiatives. So governments themselves might actually be one of the people providing the subsidies, particularly if it's in an environment where actually it's the government who's expected to help people after an event and who have traditionally played that role of supporting people. And they may do this with the aim that they are actually passing some of that responsibility to the individual. So rather than it all falling on the government to repairing all the homes, they're actually getting the population involved in that and trying to get some of that management done by the individuals or by groups. Do you think that is an excuse for governments to relieve themselves of the responsibilities of taking care of their own citizens after a disaster? I don't, I don't think it's a question of relieving responsibility because actually in this, they are still taking responsibility because they are subsidising a programme. And what they're doing is they're transferring from just looking after an event occurs and paying out after to actually doing more planning for before. And I mean, that's what disastrous reduction is all about. And that's so where we're going. It's actually being more responsible in the long run. I think it is being more responsible in the long run because they're planning for events. They're getting the community involved. You know, it's not just, a, oh, if it happens, you know, this is where we'll go. We're looking at these events involved. And also over time, the hope can actually be that you know places get more developed, right? We're, we're, we're always helping, hoping that places get more developed. Well, it depends where exactly where you are in the world, but generally that's you know that's what we're trying to achieve. And so 
it might be that part of that path is to, is reducing risk. You know, disaster risk reduction is so key to development. You, you can't develop without effective disaster risk reduction because disasters set you back so much. And so actually having a microinsurance initiative where the government provides on the subsidy and the government supporting it can actually play a role in people managing the risk better and meaning that actually as you develop, you move perhaps from microinsurance to more nearer traditional insurance as well as that sort of development goal with the government taking so one less role we also need to consider what actually happens after an event if it's a very large event we might have individual people affected but you also have critical infrastructure affected hospitals schools communication systems roads transport links um and we need the government to sort those out as well because without those then you know people aren't there so actually getting other agencies involved and getting the private sector involved can actually help the government in the time when they're in most need as well so it's also a question of you know helping the as well as helping the people transfer the risk to the schemes it can also help the government because it's all very well for people investing in the schemes but if the government's helping the scheme we need to help the government as well yes. so we, yeah. want, we want these things to progress and I guess by uh, those sorts of partnerships are always advantageous in terms of actually including people as well. So in a lot of situations, um, there may be populations that live in informal settlements or don't necessarily have access to formal finance or formal um, sort of means of, of, of social support, essentially. So how, how could the government working with other agents encourage that and in a sort of framework of disaster risk reduction. So looking at how people can receive help with building resilience into their, their own lives. Well, you know, you, you touched there on things like people who aren't involved in the financial systems. Well, actually being part of a micro initiative, micro insurance initiative might mean they do get access to those systems. And we heard about the case study earlier where it was actually part of a saving initiative. It might be part of being allowed a loan if you have these micro insurance initiatives because it makes you a kind of a better prospect. It makes you more secure. So if you have a small business and you have a loan, um, you might be very risky. You know, it might be a very risky loan. However, if you're part of a micro insurance scheme, people might be more likely to give you that loan. So it helps you become part of those systems. And it's not just the finance when you're part of those systems that you're getting access to. You're getting access to those expertise. You're getting access to those resources. So it helps you be part of that, that system. And a particular group you mentioned there as well are, are people who are from informal settlements as well. So those who are sort of outside, not just financial systems, but for any systems, we, we look at things like migrant populations, refugees, they may be outside all systems. And if there was a way of at least getting some form of microinsurance, some form of resilience, even on informal settlements, whether we want long term these settlements to exist or not, it can help the people who are so vulnerable at that time. And this is where it's really critical. That's the time they're most vulnerable. We want to look at long term development, but we also want to really help people when they most need it. So that expertise, um, I think that's a really critical part of it. And that, that expertise that you touched on there could also include um, you know, assistance with with being individually preemptive as well. So the advantage is, you know, again, we've got this sort of cyclical advantage, uh, you know, system of benefits, whereby if you are able to make some, um, you know, if you understand your personal risk and you're, you're able to make some um, improvements to your environment or to your home or your, your personal plans for any sort of hazard that may come along, that in turn then, I suppose, could count towards making microinsurance more accessible by perhaps having you know the ability to lower premiums if you're less risky by building in those mitigation efforts it could then in turn i guess make an insurance scheme a little bit more um, accessible it could and that can be done both at the individual level and also in microinsurance schemes at the community level mm -hmm. or at the sector level or whatever level it is and you can actually come together and rather than tackling it as an individual you can actually think as a community okay let, let, we're looking at setting up this life insurance initiative how can we make it cheaper or how can we make it more beneficial what can we do as a community to work together now that might be happening anyway you know it might not mean that you need micro insurance to get a community feel that you know that, that might be there already but here's another drive and it might also be an opportunity for help 
you know, it might be a time when you've got that interest and you've got that scheme occurring where you can actually say, well, why not part of this premium we're paying be put towards a scheme that's helping us more long term to build that resilience? And that's where you can start getting these joint ventures. So it, it's, you know, yes, lots of these things can happen without microinsurance, but this is a great way of bringing them together mm. and making sure it really does happen and looking it through the lens of a quantitative risk assessment approach to making an informed decision about risk. And that's that's really critical because you can actually get that expertise of looking at the risk, understanding different mitigation techniques, understanding the implications, both socially, financially, and from a risk reduction point of view, bring them all together and saying, okay, how can we make this a success? So with all of that in mind, it's the humanitarian case is quite clear. Um, it obviously, microinsurance obviously has a strong role potentially to play. Um, not only in sort of personal community disaster risk reduction and resilience building, but also in sort of integration of, of sectors and, and essentially sort of taking some of the responsibility off the response and, you know, by building in preemptive disaster, you know, resilience, you're then sort of putting those building blocks in place so that then the response over time necessarily doesn't need to be so dramatic. And it's this this sort of sense of, of building that coping capacity. But what about, that, that's all very well, and, and it, it, it's great, it, it seems to be a great thing for that, but, but how do we make it sustainable? So beyond the, the response, so for example, you know, we have that period afterwards when say, you know, community gets payments. How do we make um, a, a microfinance, a microinsurance scheme consistent and last over the long term so you know if we think about the key players in this um you know low income populations one of the most prominent problems is is paying premiums over the long term how do we make a potential business case out of this so that it does actually have some self-sustainability built in well this is really key we've we've mentioned the humanitarian side and sort of focused on this idea of microinsurance as a humanitarian initiative but as you say, it needs to be sustainable. It needs to last. And what you really don't want is it to run for five years, there'd be no disaster, and in year six, there's a disaster. And then the people are left and the money that they've paid towards the scheme hasn't even helped them at all because you know, they haven't even saved the money they've, they've spent it. So it's really key that we make these, um, these schemes uh, sustainable. And this is where that partnership and that sort of intersection between it being a humanitarian initiative and a business venture comes into play. So what we really want is it to be seen here through the humanitarian lens. And that's sort of how we make sure it's seen as microinsurance, not just as a smaller version of insurance. So we have these added helps, we have these sort of slightly different structures, the flexibility, the group approach, some subsidies initially perhaps. But how can we move that? Eventually we want to move it into being mainstream insurance but, or maybe a group insurance policy. And the key part is that business venture. Eventually, we want it to be profitable or at least neutral for the insurer who's offering it, because that way it can keep going. Because otherwise, eventually, you run out of a donor or you know someone pulls out and it's not sustainable. And this is where it's a really interesting example of a disaster risk reduction technique where we are marrying these sectors together. And, and this is really common in disaster risk reduction where it's not a question of saying it's all for the individual, it's all for the state, it's all for the humanitarian sector, it's all as a private enterprise. Where success and innovation really comes through is where they come together. In the case of my insurance, it's about making it, as I say, at least cost neutral or maybe even profitable for the insurance company, but that rarely can come straight away. It needs to be seen as the long game. And you know, if you make it initially successful, and perhaps you have some subsidies from the government, then you can make it at least neutral for the insurer, or at least you know, as low cost as possible. And then gradually, the wealth should, should get there. You know, as development comes, we hope there's more wealth in the area. At the higher level of predictability, and the better resilience, because you're not losing all your everything when there's a disaster, you are getting a payout, means it's more predictable, you know what's happening, or to some extent, um, you know, at least in, in that barrier, it, it means you can actually really help with development. 
and therefore the business case comes down the line either because it's more predictable you have more wealth in the region or because the government recognizes the role and how much more powerful this is making the people how much more self-agency we're giving and therefore we can make sure that the insurer doesn't just see it as a humanitarian venture i think for a long time it will be you know it can be part of corporate social responsibility but it doesn't have to be just a loss you know it, it can have benefits as well and you're educating a new market you know in long term there's a new insurance market for you so it's the long game i would say but it, it does bring these two together it's also important you know we have separated micro insurance from insurance but there's sort of meso insurance in the middle perhaps where we move you know it's, it's there's not a clear line you know this is what we said right at the beginning there's not a clear definition um we say this has more of this and more of this well gradually as we move across there is a point where it becomes more like a business venture and more like mainstream insurance so that's the idea that we gradually you know over time you hopefully move more into the business venture end more closer to mainstream insurance but that takes time it does and i think um the building up of the proof of concept to people to whom it is a new idea is also comes into play so with time you can build reputational trust and you can build better buy-in um, from the people that you're actually trying to help with these products. Exactly. And so, you know, overall, this really is all about building resilience. Short term, if there's a disaster in the next couple of years, but longer term in terms of development and disaster risk reduction. And reducing the barriers or eliminating the barriers to disaster risk reduction is one of the key themes that we look at in our masters, building resilience and eliminating those barriers to disaster risk reduction. We learn more about insurance. We learn more about other mechanisms um, involved in disaster risk reduction. And we learn more about different examples of how we can use um, the different roles of government, um, private enterprise and humanitarian sector all to achieve that aim of building resilience. Hello again. Um, so hopefully that went a bit more into the um, question about where we go between the humanitarian sector end and the business venture end. So at this point, again, I um, come back to you if anyone has any questions, if you want anything cl uh, clarified, or you just want to get in there with a bit of debate, then please go ahead. I see um, Candice has her hand up. Uh, please go ahead, Candice. Hi. Um... I basically have a question when it comes to, so you're talking about like informal populations um, and like remote populations have like very, very, very little means could be put under this micro insurance. And I was just kind of wondering how in the sense that I can imagine that, I mean, if you're like, for example, like a remote population in the middle of the Sahara and you have almost zero or very, very, very little means, I don't really understand how you could pay like a premium. I was like basically like how low are the payments i was kind of wondering because I, I i struggle to see how remote or informal populations can be put under such a package it's great but i i kind of struggle to see how well that's a, that's a really good question candice and actually um it raises a, a couple of really important points about microinsurance more generally and um one of those is that um that sort of that particular context would fall under, under the predominantly the sort of development humanitarian side, mm -hmm. whereby you may have a big player like the World Bank involved, um, and they essentially fund um, the, the project for you, they fund the scheme so that it may be that uh, the people themselves either pay in a minute amount just for that sort of buy-in and that ownership, or it may be that they don't at all, and it really is just a purely humanitarian scheme, and those premiums are essentially paid for them, and the protection is provided. Now, that might be over a shorter time period as a result, for example, if there is one year when it's at, um, it's uh, for, for example, a bad, a particularly bad drought is forecast. That may be a humanitarian intervention that is then put in place to protect those people. Um, the other important point I think that that raises is that um, microinsurance 
doesn't necessarily work or is not necessarily appropriate for everyone. And there may well be situations where it's fantastic for some people, but there may also be situations where it's simply not going to work. It simply won't be sustainable. And we might be able to put in a humanitarian intervention like that, for example, for a couple of years or, some, or so, but over the long term, it's just not viable. And we need to find different approaches and different ways of protecting people. So I think that's a big part of identifying you know, the fact that it's it's not um, a global panacea and it's not always going to be the best option, but it's something that should be explored where possible. Okay, I, I see. Thank you. I wasn't, I forgot, like, the, I wasn't concerned, like, the international institutions part of it, but that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That's all right. We may have time for one final question. Um, if anyone has a, a final question they want to ask, then please do uh, speak out or put it in the chat. I've got one, Joanna, just come through. If you want me to just quickly answer. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, there's a, a quick question about um, whether microinsurance can help preemptive action. So is it always, even if it's really fast, is it always something that can help after an event happens? And actually, it can be preemptive. And there have been situations, one of the case studies actually in Peru, whereby it was worked purely off forecasting. Um, and one year, it was forecast, it was a particularly bad case of flooding in one in this area of Peru. And the insurance company designed a very new experimental product so that payouts were made before the flood actually happened so that people could put in things like you know extra drainage systems and mitigation efforts so that their their land wouldn't flood as badly in the first instance um, it was experimental and it, it they struggled with the sustainability element but it's one of those um, areas that is increasingly explored and i know now that people are looking at micro insurance and insurance products more generally as a means of paying out before a disaster happens so that people can just evacuate you know just can just pack up a big lorry and move their things into a, to a different location and protect themselves keep themselves and their primary assets safe thank you rebecca um i'm afraid that's all we've got time for today um but for those of you who are coming to join us we, we do talk a lot more about insurance um, and other aspects of of all these topics um, when you come along so Thank you so much to those of you who joined us. Um, thank you to Rebecca for helping me as well um, and uh, having that interesting conversation. And I uh, wish you all well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.